I've never done a pre-introduction to a book, but I wanna do this to ask that you kind of bear with me in the beginning. I'm glad that I did. I didn't read this book to start off with. I didn't preview it. And what we start with are the reviews, the forward, the preface, and then the introduction. We actually don't even get through the introduction. We don't get to chapter one or anything in this hour long video. So what really is going on, and the reason I wanna ask that you kind of bear with me is that we start off with what I hope will appeal to Christians that might be interested in watching this. So if you have any friends that are Christians or if you're Christian yourself, please definitely check out the first part of this and the second portion where we get to the introduction. The reason is that this book should be directed at atheists. This book should be directed at people who are on the fence or otherwise non-Christian. And instead, we go into this part about tangents about liberals that we don't like, misunderstanding modern concepts of truth and morality, bringing up the Holocaust for absolutely no reason. And it just seems like a rant from Christians to other Christians from the beginning. And that really disappointed me. But once we get into the introduction, so we go to the, from the very last paragraph of the preface, the rest of it is just trash. From that last paragraph to the parts of the introduction we do read, finally this gets into something that actually does appeal to atheists. So I do think this is an interesting watch if you're a Christian, just to see how not to talk to atheists. And also if you're an atheist, this might be just sort of some background noise for a while about just the frustrations that we have um, trying to communicate with a group of people that refuse to try to understand what we're saying. But actually it does get better. So I am interested in reading the rest of this book because of just this little bit that we read from the introduction. I, I'm interested in it. So hopefully this will be an interesting watch for you guys. Anyway, let's get into the video. Hi everyone. I've wanted to do a read through of this book for a while and I still haven't. So let's go ahead and do it together. This book was written back in 2004 and it's actually something that Christian me would have said in 2004. In fact, I remember at least one time very clearly talking to somebody on the walk home from school to my house saying that I didn't have enough faith to be an atheist. I don't know why we were discussing religion, but that was my statement. So what does this actually mean from a Christian point of view? Well, at least from my point of view as a Christian, this meant that God really answers all of my questions about those big unanswerable things, right? Where did we come from? How did the universe come to be? God, God, God. Why do bad things happen? Well, God gave us free will, Satan exists, these things are bound to happen. And if we still don't really understand it, we can trust in God's perfect plan and that he works on a different timeline than we do, aka God works in mysterious ways. So when I used to say I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, this was the idea that if I gave up the idea of who created the universe being God, then who created the universe? Ha, I can't answer that, therefore I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. I had this idea that atheists firmly believe in no God or that they reject the idea of gods outright or that they believe nothing created everything. And of course, none of those things have to be true. While some atheists do have a firm belief that no gods exist, most atheists, including myself, just have this idea that we're not really sure. And so rather than writing an answer, we're waiting for an answer, which is actually what I prefer my students do. When a student doesn't have an answer to the question, I much prefer that they come and ask me so they can learn the answer, as opposed to just writing in an answer so they can finish the assignment. So that's kind of where I feel that Christianity and other religions that have this creator concept, this is where I feel like they are putting in an answer which limits them from finding the real answer. One of the other reasons I wanted to read this book is because it was written by Frank Turek. It was also written by um, a guy named Norman L. Geisler. I haven't heard of this person personally, um, but definitely Frank Turek is a big name in apologetics. And I remember my mother sending me this video of Frank Turek talking about DNA proving God. She sent this to me when I had first told her that I was atheist. And this was when I was living in Korea, so all she could do was send me stuff on Facebook. 
and she said, if you watch this, we I promise we can talk about it. And I remember watching it and writing all these notes and getting really frustrated that she refused to talk to me about it afterwards. So this is why Frank Turek as a guy just kind of stands out in my mind. But I also remember watching him while we were at church too. And it was something again about chromosome shape or something and that something something God particle. And in this way, he proved God with science. Not exactly. The ideas he was putting together, these were things I really thought were a slam dunk back as a Christian, but as an atheist, go back to the court and try again. So I wanted to go ahead and just read this for you guys. Um, if you are the type of person like me who just likes to have YouTube videos on in the background, that's what this is. Nothing is going to be going on um, on the screen, so feel free to not watch the screen. So we check the first page of the book. We get a lot of feedback from different authors that read it. So one is from Lee Strobel who writes, clear, complete, compelling. This terrific resource will help both Christians and seekers understand the rational basis for Christianity. I wish it had been available when I was an atheist. It would have saved me a lot of time, my spiritual journey toward God. From Josh McDowell, another author who is an apologetics peddler, apologeticist, <laughs> he says, this extremely readable book brilliantly builds the case for Christianity from the question of truth all the way to the inspiration of the Bible. And the verdict is in. Christians stand on mounds of solid evidence while skeptics cling to nothing but their blind, dogmatic faith. Oh boy. If you're still a skeptic after reading, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, then I suspect you're living in denial. Yikes. All right, well, I guess uh, in this case, Josh believes that everything in this book is going to help you and I uh, totally reach Christianity. So if Jack Chick couldn't do it, maybe Frank Turek can. Uh, Philip E. Johnson, who again is another apologetics writer, it is really true that atheism requires gobs of blind faith, while the path of logic and reason leads straight to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Norman Geisler and Frank Turek convincingly show why. All right. Hank Hanegraaff. Oh my goodness. Hank Hanegraaff. Oh, this, mm, this, mm, this takes me back. <laughs> I, I remember listening to him on the radio and he wrote a book. Oh gosh, I would love to read this again as an atheist because I, oh, he wrote a book that was The Face That Exposes the Farce of Evolution. And it was one of those things where I pulled over because I had heard the advertisement before. I knew that he was going to share the phone number so I could order it. So I pulled over on the side of the road so I could write down the phone number. And this is, you know, before smartphones and everything. And so I just remember writing it down, ordering the book. It was one of the only times I ever ordered a book and I was blown away by how amazing Hank Hanegraaff was. So just to see this name again, oh my goodness. Uh, yeah, let's, let's do his book eventually. <laughs> I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. We'll equip, exhort, and encourage you to give the reason for the hope that you have with gentleness and respect. And that's a quote from the Bible. Uh, when people ask you why you're religious, or sorry, why you're a Christian, why you believe in God, why you have faith, um, that's the response. You have to give the reason for the hope you have. And finally, Cal Thomas, who is a syndicated columnist and host of After Hours on the Fox News channel. So I guess just a type of journalist. Um, I haven't heard of this guy in apologetics. No amount of evidence can convert an unbeliever to belief. That is solely the work of God. But what Norm Geisler and Frank Turek have done in this book should disturb anyone claiming to be an atheist, perhaps enough to persuade them to begin a search for God who has been there all along. Now this is assuming that we haven't searched for God or that a lot of us didn't reach the atheism conclusion searching for a deeper relationship with God. So I, I, I guess maybe this might work for an atheist who never was Christian. Maybe they don't have some of the same questions that those of us that left religion might have, but let's go ahead and find out. Never mind. It turns out there's uh, several more reviews. So this is from William A. Dembski, who wrote uh, The Design Revolution. False ideas aimed at undermining and destroying the Christian faith constantly bombard high school and college students. Oh, goodness. This is something I remember hearing, and it was, a key, or it was said by me, or said to me by both of my parents, 
that the reason I became atheist is because of college and they poisoned my mind with evolution. Now keep in mind I was studying like buildings. <laughs> I didn't take a lot of biology. <laughs> so this idea that evolution kind of tears down um, my very strong, I mean, they knew that I had a very strong faith. So this idea that, oh yeah, a couple college courses or one biology course ripped apart everything, even though they don't really talk too much about evolution, it's more about just, you know, cell walls and those things. <sighs> this book provides an exceptionally good antidote to these false ideas. Sounds like Hank Hanegraaff. Geisler and Turek present the crucial information needed to avoid being swept away by the onslaughts of secular ideologies that cast science, philosophy, and biblical studies as enemies of the Christian faith. Biblical studies as enemies of the Christian faith. Okay. Ravi Zachariah. Oh my goodness. These are some, these are names. Okay. If you know about some of these guys, they are cut, taking me back. Oh. Geisler and Turek have pulled together a wide array of thorny questions and, as always, have responded with skill and insight. This is a valuable addition to the contemporary writings on Christian apologetics. Are we getting excited yet? John Ankerberg, host of The John Ankerberg Show, says that this book title is Vintage Norman Geisler, A Logical, Rational, and Intellectual Defense of the Christian Faith. This collaboration with Frank Turek is must reading for every professional or armchair philosopher. Okay, interesting. And finally, Jay Budzizisky, wow, I really apologize to any, I think, Poles. So this is a former atheist, that's how it's written, for that part of his title, former atheist, professor of government and philosophy, University of Texas at Austin, author, What We Can't Not Know. Anyone can understand this book's crystal clear explanation of how morality itself points to God. Atheists may believe in moral law, but without God, they have no way to justify their belief. Well, but Zizewski, maybe you haven't spoken to many atheists who gave it a lot of thought. Maybe you didn't give it a lot of thought. I mean, any, I, I mean, I can't think of an atheist who doesn't understand how to justify morality without leaning on a God. So that's a bit surprising. I do wonder about what some of these guys claiming to be a former atheist, what do they mean? And I, I don't want to be the, you know, a no true Scotsman fallacy type of, you know, this turning this into a no true Scotsman fallacy type of thing. But in Christian circles, someone who's not on fire for Jesus can be labeled as an atheist. Or if you aren't really sure if God's there or you're angry at God, these are people that also get labeled as atheists. And so somebody like this guy who perhaps was a Christian, but just stopped going to church and didn't really care and said, well, maybe it's not all that important that we follow the Bible and maybe other ideas about God are okay, sort of a universalist kind of approach. This is somebody who could say that he was a former atheist with a straight face. So these types of people who still believe in a God, they're still considered atheists by certain types of evangelical Christians because they're not the right type of Christian or behaving in the right type of way. So I do, I always wonder about what do you mean by former atheist? So we're not sure, we can't ask him. So there is a foreword here by David Limbaugh. So we're gonna go ahead and read that. As one who came to Christ after years of skepticism, I have, I have particular affection for Christian apologetics. It is one of my passions. There is an abundance of evidence for the reliability of scripture, for the authority of the Bible as the inspired word of God, and that the Bible accurately portrays the historical events it covers, including the earthly life of Jesus Christ. Indeed, powerful and convincing proof exists that Christianity is the one true religion, that the triune God who reveals himself in its pages is the one and only God of the universe, and that Christ died for our sins so that we may live. Well, let me tell you, David, when I tried to find that as a Christian, I came up empty-handed. Proof, of course, is no substitute for faith, which is essential to our salvation and for our communion with God. Nor is the study of apologetics disrespectful to our faith. Rather, it augments it, informs it, bolsters it, and reinvigorates it. Were it otherwise, the Bible would not say, always be prepared to give an answer for, to everyone who asks for the reason for the hope that you have, 1 Peter 3.15. 
I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist is the best single book I've seen to prepare believers to give the reasons for their faith and for skeptics who are open to the truth. Now, I don't like this because right away this is a book that, from its title, I feel like this should appeal or at least be written to the non-believer. It should be written for the non-Christian. But the first person that David says this book is for is for Christians. So I, I do worry about that. It kind of reminds me about the one of the other books that we read that was supposed to, it, it, the title seemed like it was for atheists or at least non-Christians, but it ended up just kind of being a book for Christians to feel more Christian-y. So I, I, I'm a bit worried already. This book will serve as an indispensable evangelism tool, especially when dealing with non-believers with intellectual, quote unquote, obstacles to the faith. As we know, the intellectual obstacles are usually just an excuse for the non-believers, but when you remove the substance of their excuse, they are left naked to confront the real obstacles, their real demons, sir, sir. <laughs> So, you know, David's out here saying, you know, these ideas that they come up with, they're just made up. It's that atheists are really scared that they're going to have to answer to God. Now, this is something that really doesn't make sense, because if I believe deep down that a God exists and that I'm committing sins and that I'm going to be serving some kind of eternal punishment for those sins, why not just be Christian and get sa saved and get forgiven for those sins I can keep committing those sins because all fall short of the glory of God and no human is perfect. And then I can just get forgiveness so I can go to heaven. So if I wanted to wrestle with my demons, why not wrestle with it in a Christian context? Why would I privately wrestle with it as an atheist? That makes absolutely no sense. It's something we're told in church, but when you think about it, it doesn't make any sense at all. But I believe there's another important reason for the scriptural mandate to be prepared to give an answer. It's not just to help us effectively communicate the gospel. Being prepared will also arm us with the tools to resist certain nagging doubts that we encounter in moments of weakness. Here it is. This is the reason for the book. It will, because it marshals the evidence for Christianity, fortify our faith. So it will fortify our faith. That's really who it's for. This is written for Christians who want to feel like they are able to address these nagging doubts. And it's definitely easier to address those nagging doubts when you come at it from a position of faith. When you already believe that God will provide all answers, that God is perfect and his, his word is law, he's got a plan, etc., etc. When you have some stuff that kind of sounds sciencey to go with it, it's a lot easier to adopt it and say, yep, this is proof of God. When you don't come at it from that perspective, you can't really say this by itself is proof of a God and the Christian God in particular. And that's actually what really turned me into an atheist was having to try to explain my faith, assuming the other person wasn't a believer and realizing that all of the quote unquote evidence and personal experiences with God that I had, none of that by itself actually pointed to a God. It only made sense if you assume that the spiritual world existed, but if you don't assume it exists, in and of itself it doesn't prove it existed. So that's what made me atheist. I realized I was coming at it with this, this uh, really hefty presupposition. Who can doubt that we need to be better equipped with the evidence, whether it helps us better evangelize or strengthen our own faith? There it is. As if the temptations of the flesh weren't enough for us to contend with, we are also confronted daily with negative external influences. In modern times, these influences have grown increasingly sinister and insidious, as the Bible warned they would. I mean, how? Because you see them more often with social media? In times past, non-believers had to decide whether Christianity was the one true religion, whether any of them were true, or whether God existed at all. But they generally were not saddled with the burden of determining whether there was such a thing as truth. Our postmodern culture has done a number on the idea of truth. 
It teaches that truth and morality are relative and that there's no such thing as an absolute truth. Now this is one thing that I, I do want to say is kind of distorted by Christians. This idea of my truth um, or this idea that it's true for me, these are things that are subjective. You know, it's true for me that coffee tastes better than tea, right? And, and that's a true statement from my perspective. But to say that coffee does or does not exist, or the history of coffee is exactly the same as the history of tea because I decided it was, that these are things that are objective, right? You can't say that one, that this is relative truth here. So it's, it's a bit strange. To the intellectual elite dominating our universities and the mainstream media, these ideas are considered enlightened and progressive, even though we all intuitively understand that absolute truth does exist. And more importantly, we all conduct our lives with that recognition. Yeah, this is, this is a person who doesn't really understand the positions of atheists. If you encounter one of these geniuses who is so certain that truth is a social construct defined by the powerful to remain in power, ask him if he would be willing to test his theory by leaping from the tallest building around. Ugh. You might want to quiz him on the law of non-contradiction, ask him whether he believes that two contradictory things can be true at the same time. If he has the intellectual dishonesty to say yes, ask him how he is certain that absolute truth does not exist. Is he absolutely certain? This whole, mm, this whole paragraph, my goodness, this, it, it's basically saying, I don't understand the argument being made and I'm going to argue against my misunderstanding. I don't even know if this person realizes they are creating a straw man. I don't know. Do they really think this is what people believe? Yes, truth is a casualty of our popular culture. And when truth goes, the authority of the gospel is undermined because the gospel tells us all about the truth, capital T, we can see the evidence of this everywhere today. The modern notions of tolerance and pluralism are a direct result of the culture's assault on truth. We're not gonna unpack that. <laughs> Whew. Maybe he will. Liberal secularists insist that tolerance is the highest virtue, but they don't tell you what they mean by tolerance. To them, tolerance doesn't simply involve treating those with, differences, with different ideas respectfully and civilly. It means affirming their ideas as valid, which Christians can't do without renouncing their own beliefs. If, for example, you subscribe to the biblical prohibition on homosexual behavior is sinful, you cannot at the same time affirm that such behavior is not sinful. Now, I, I agree with this concept, but you know, from a Christian perspective, I agree with this concept. Um, but nobody's like, well, how is this related to tolerance? So yeah, just say I am intolerant to accepting that. Just, just say that. Nobody says you can't be intolerant. You can be intolerant. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's nice if you're, you're not necessarily, I mean, you know, it depends, I guess, but you know, tolerating things, it means to it's not the idea that we just accept everything. It's the idea that there are certain things that we should take a step back and ask ourselves, yes, this is how people did it traditionally, but is this worth maintaining simply for the sake of tradition? The postmodern secularist doesn't have to confront these questions because he rejects the idea of absolute truth and the law of non-contradiction. Okay, so apparently, so, so notice that he, David created this this liberal secularist and then says, you know, well, if he's as intellectually dishonest, blah, blah, blah. And then he keeps going on just to say, this is how they all are. He can just go on his merry way, moralizing to everyone about tolerance and never having to explain the intrinsic contradiction in his views. Maybe you just didn't listen to his views, David. The tolerance peddlers are further exposed as frauds when you consider that they simply will not practice what they preach, at least toward those annoyingly stubborn Christians. They are absolutely unwilling to tolerate the Christian premise that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. For them to acknowledge this would ne necessarily refute their concept of tolerance, which holds the idea that all ideas are of equal merit. That is not the concept of tolerance. Where is he getting this? 
In their infinite resourcefulness, they carve out an exception to demand for universal tolerance when it comes to their treatment of Christians. You know, honestly, guys, I, I don't know what I was expecting cracking open this book. And, and we're only in the forward. Already, we're met with some of the most unnecessary tangents, aren't we? I don't have enough faith to be atheist. This is the idea that the book is going to provide us evidence to support the Bible. And instead of giving us this evidence, it's just, I don't like these people because I don't understand what they're actually saying. And what I do misunderstand is stupid to me. So I'm going to go on about how this is stupid and they're all hypocrites, etc., etc. What does this have to do with, with Christianity being supported by mounds of evidence? I, I mean, for the sake of reading this, I, I'm going to read it, but honestly, if it was just me by myself, I'd probably skip over this because it, I don't see anything here getting us any closer to the claim that there's a good reason to have faith in Christianity. To them, Christianity's exclusive truth claims are simply beyond the pale, so bad as to disqualify Christians from receiving tolerance from others. No. One secularist university administrator, for instance, disciplined a conservative professor for exposing her class to literature from a Christian viewpoint, which included an article about how teachers should approach homosexuality. The administrator exclaimed, we cannot tolerate the intolerable. You see, it's fairly easy for these types to extricate themselves from their indefensible positions. They simply move goalposts. Talk about defining truth through power. But what, what university, right? Which administrator? When did this happen? And, and again, if you're a Christian reading this to reaffirm your faith, you're just going to go with it. This is the kind of stuff that I'm talking about, where if you already come at it believing this stuff, adding another story to it, yeah, I already believe that this doesn't sound bizarre to me. Obviously, the Christian was in the right and the secular institution was in the wrong. There's no nuance that needs to be considered. We don't actually have to provide names of anybody or any place. I know it's true because this person says it's true because God says that we're going to be targeted and we're being targeted. Therefore, God is right, which I already knew because the Bible is what I believe in. But the Christian's belief that theirs is the one true religion doesn't make them intolerant of others or disrespectful of their right to believe and worship how they choose. Our modern culture is woefully confused about these distinctions, sir. <laughs> sir. <laughs> And they use Christians' confidence in their own belief system to paint Christians as intolerant of others with different belief systems. Nothing could be more inaccurate, sir. <laughs> Besides, for the record, Christianity isn't the only religion with exclusive truth claims. All major religions have such claims. Many of the central ideas of the major religions cannot be reconciled, which gives the lie to the trendy tenet of pluralism that all religions at their core are the same. We often hear or read that all people, wherever located, worship the same God through different languages and cultures. This idea, with all due respect, is absurd on its face. Well, okay, I'm glad we're giving the ideas uh, respect, right? Not people that we're insulting, but the idea, sure. For example, Islam teaches that Christ was a mere prophet, not deity. As C.S. Lewis observed, if Christ is not God, then he could not have been an exemplary prophet or a great moral teacher because he claimed to be God. And if he wasn't who he said he was, then he was either a liar or a lunatic, hardly a great moral teacher or prophet. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard this, and I don't know why he's observing it, but no, as C.S. Lewis decided or thought through because um, he didn't observe Jesus saying anything, right? How could he be exemplary or a great moral teacher? I, I don't know what was especially fabulous about what Jesus said. I, I don't know what was especially insightful or unique about what Jesus claimed. You know, nonviolence, this wasn't the first time that somebody said it, and Jesus was, you know, flipping over tables and stuff. This wasn't a guy who was totally nonviolent, right? What, I mean, what, what are some things that only Jesus said that are just great moral teachings? I, I can't think of anything that's unique to him, especially at that time period. And if he wasn't who he said he was, he was either a liar or a lunatic, okay. So... So yeah, we can just, so this idea is that C.S. Lewis is, is saying, oh, he must be God because otherwise he isn't that awesome 
and he's a liar or he's crazy. Why not go with that, right? Maybe he just was another cult leader. That's that's what I personally think. It's it's not a great leap to assume that there were cult leaders. Another obvious example, the claims of a certain Eastern religions that God is in everything, that there's no discrete distinction between the creator and creation is utterly irreconcilable with Christianity. The examples are endless. But the point is that while various religions may share some overlapping values, many of their fundamental beliefs cannot be squared. It may make people feel better to pretend that all religions are essentially the same, but this concept is demonstrably false. I mean, I, I agree with that. They're not all essentially the same. I, I still have to teach my students, you know, the difference between monotheism, polytheism, pantheism. But political correctness in our culture generally carries the day. Even many of our churches have become corrupted with the misguided notions of tolerance and pluralism. They have allowed their theology to be diluted and have permitted the authority of scripture to be denigrated in favor of society's evolved ideas about morality. Only a version of Christianity that preaches that all religions are the same is tolerant and loving. Traditional Bible-based Christianity is intolerant, insensitive, exclusive, and unloving. How loving, though, is it to become an accomplice to the destruction of truth itself, to the evisceration of the gospel? How sensitive is it to aid people away from the path of life? As a Christian, how can you explain Christ's decision voluntarily to subject himself to the indignities and humiliation of human form, to experience wholesale separation from the Father, to physically accept all of the real wrath of the Father for all mankind's past, present, and future sins, and to suffer the indescribable torment and death on the cross if all other paths to God are the same? So, again, this is talking to Christians. It says, as a Christian, how can you explain? So it's assuming that you reading this are a Christian. Are, are there any apologetics that are written for non-Christians? That's, that's, that's my question. Because everything that presents itself as this idea of, yes, this is written to address the main concerns of atheists in particular, like this book is talking about atheists, not about anybody else, not about Muslims, not about Buddhists, but about atheists. What an immeasurable insight to the finished work of Christ on the cross. What an act of deliberate disobedience to Christ's direction that we spread the gospel to the corners of the earth. For if all religions are the same, then we've made a liar out of Christ and rendered his great commission a useless farce because we have removed all incentive to evangelize. I'm not suggesting that Christians should approach evangelism stridently or disrespectfully. We should certainly honor the principle that all people are equal in God's sight and entitled to equal protection of the laws as well as fair, courteous, and respectful treatment. Oh yeah, we saw some of that fair, courteous, and respectful treatment up, up a, few, uh, a few paragraphs. But there is no moral imperative that we adopt the notion that all belief systems are equally true. There is no moral imperative that we do not. The above reference scriptural passage instructing us to be prepared to give reasons for our faith is immediately followed by the caution, but do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. We must be mindful of the next sentence as well. It is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for all sins once and for all, with righteous the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. We must preach the truth, even if it makes us unpopular, even if it leads to the charge that we are intolerant or insensitive, even if it leads to our suffering or persecution. Yes, we must evangelize with gentleness and respect, but above all, we must evangelize. We must not be silenced by the intoler or by the tolerance police. So again, I, I feel like this is almost, how to describe it? it? It's almost as if David is trying to have a private conversation with a Christian, like, hey, you know those filthy, hypocritical, stupid atheists who obviously are stupid because they can't even get their worldview straight because they're obviously hypocrites because they can't think straight and they can't think straight because they lie about being intellectually blocked against God, but really it's because they don't want to face their own terrible demons. Huh, we know about them, right? Okay, so in this book, we're gonna talk about them as terrible as they are, but remember when you do talk to them in person, be nice, be respectful, okay? That's what it says to do, to be respectful. So this conversation about these dirty, stupid atheists, yeah, that's just between us. Don't call them that to their face though, okay? 
God loved them, right? God says love them, be nice to them, be respectful. This is so bizarre, isn't it? It's so bizarre. I thought this was written for atheists. Who, who let this guy write this thing? <laughs> I frequently come into contact with people who either don't believe in Christianity or who do but have serious problems with parts of the Bible or elements of the Christian doctrine. I'm certainly no expert in theology, so what do I tell these people? Beyond suggesting the daunting task of reading the Bible from start to finish, how do I help them to discover the truths that I belatedly discovered? There are so many wonderful books available that will help, but there seem to be drawbacks with each one. They are too scholarly or too incomplete or too difficult to read. To get the complete package, I usually have to recommend more than one book, which significantly decreases the chances that any of them will be read. Wow. So he's referring to his fellow Christians as just too stupid to understand some of these intellectual books. So you got to read something a little bit simple to get the idea. I had this issue when I was a Christian that why do I need to read all these other books telling me how to read the Bible? Why do I have to read books from these Christian authors that tell me how to interpret the Bible? I have the spirit of discernment. I have the Holy Ghost. Surely God is just going to allow me to understand, right? And so why should I start reading the Gospels and then start reading the uh, Old Testament? Because we, we were told, start with the Gospels, read through the Old Test or New Testament, and then read the Old Testament. Then it'll make sense. Well, then why would God allow the Bible to be put together backwards? If we're supposed to start with the New Testament and end in the Old Testament, why, are we, why would God allow that to be backwards? So I, I just thought if not even if, God is the wisest and will provide wisdom to us. I don't need to read everybody else's book. I just need to read one book. I just need to read the Bible, the end. And then we see where that led. <laughs> so this, this is why these books exist. You know, it seems like they're for Christians only because they just, you know, the daunting task of actually reading the Bible. I mean, you should read your Bible if you're a Christian. You should know what you claim to believe. You know what I mean? That's so bizarre that you would refer to it as, oh gosh, it's such a daunting task of actually knowing what you believe. But he's insulting the non-believers as having contradictory beliefs, so they don't really know what they're talking about. And yet he's all just openly saying Christians don't read their Bible. What can I recommend that's going to be easy to understand so they'll actually read something that's related to God? Not long ago, a friend asked me for resources on apologetics that he could share with his non-believing sibling. I knew that we'd probably only have one shot at this in the immediate future, so I had him come up with just the perfect book. Frankly, I put off the decision because I couldn't decide among three or four of my favorite sources, none of which by itself would have been sufficient, in my opinion. Just as I was preparing to cop out and make a recommendation of multiple books instead of just one, I received a note from Frank Turek asking me to review I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. After reading the first few chapters of this book, I was convinced my receipt of the book was providential. Finally, I thought there's one book that covers the gamut in a highly readable format. After, so he's saying that this is a book for atheists. So why is he directing this forward towards Christians and insulting atheists, but then saying, but we got to be nice to them, got to be respectful to them. This is so bizarre. Oh, it's so bizarre. After reading it, I told Frank that this is the one book I've been waiting for as an evangelical tool to explain the ideas and unveil the truth in a way that is far above my pay grade. As of the printing of this book, there will now be one source that I can recommend to skeptics, doubters, or Christians who need some reinforcing evidence. I already know 10 people to whom I will give this book. It's truly a godsend. Frank Turek, whom I've now come to know as a tremendous gentleman and Christian scholar, co-authored this book with a giant among giants in the field of Christian apologetics, Dr. Norman Geisler. I have a number of Dr. Geisler's other works, including Christian Apologetics, When Christians Ask, and When Skeptics Ask. Interestingly, I was first exposed to Dr. Geisler through a friend and former neighbor, Dr. Steve Johnson, a graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary and one of my spiritual mentors. Steve loaned me, I can't remember if I ever returned it, a videotape in which Dr. Geisler was explaining the truths of Christianity in a most entertaining and captivating way. It was at that point I decided to purchase and consume a number of his incredible books on apologetics. 
I would recommend any and all of Dr. Geiser's books, but I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist is just what the doctor ordered for a one-step source, a one-stop source, for those who might not be willing to wade through a number of books. I have to admit, the title particularly intrigued me since I have long believed that it does take more faith to be an atheist. It certainly takes more faith to believe that human beings evolved from the random interaction of molecules which somehow had to come into existence by themselves than to believe in a creator. See, exactly what I said at the beginning. This idea that I don't understand how this works, I don't under even understand what it says, I don't want to get into it, I don't want to read it, I'm just going to believe in God. It's kind of interesting because he goes on about how I'm well read, but everybody else, gosh, I can't trust that they're actually going to read anything, especially if it sounds too scholarly, which is why I'm so glad that this book exists because now it's easy to understand it's a one-stop kind of thing. But he doesn't understand, you know, he's not taking that same approach with things that he's claiming to argue against. That was one of the things that I really got into as a Christian was trying to understand what do non-believers believe? What do they say? And once I really got into it, I found that actually I don't have all the answers and neither does the Bible. And that's when I kind of started to get into apologetics, was just to try to find some answers. And you know, some of them did provide answers, but a lot of them didn't. So it, it became this idea where, well, I guess I just have to believe that God has an answer. But it was not satisfying. So maybe some of those old feelings or old thoughts will be addressed in this book. This book also appealed to me because before tackling the issue of the truth of Christianity, it addresses the issue of truth itself, conclusively proving the existence of absolute truth. It demolishes the follies of moral relativism and postmodernism and proceeds systematically to march towards the inescapable truth of the Christian religion. This is a book that had to be written and even more has to be published. So I'll stop the gushing now and let this book go to press. Many a hungry soul awaits the truths that are brilliantly set out in this work. This would have been better as like an abstract, I think. Or maybe talking to one of those atheists who received the book and saying how they responded to it. That, that would have been helpful. But instead he's just angry that other people have ideas he doesn't understand. And that's it. It's a bit bizarre. Now we have a preface. How much faith do you need to believe this book? Okay, well hopefully this will answer our question. Religious skeptics believe that books like this one can't be trusted for objective information because such books are written by religious people who have an agenda. Well, I'm, I was just hoping you just would address us. That's all. <laughs> In fact, that's the way that skeptics view the Bible. It's a biased book written by biased people. Their assessment may be true for some books about religion, but it's not true for them all. If it were, you couldn't trust anything you read concerning religion, including books written by atheists or skeptics, because every writer has a viewpoint on religion. This is a really misunderstanding of the, the discussion of the argument that these are biased. When, we're, when people are talking about having a bias, it's not there are some people without a bias and those are the people we listen to because everyone is biased. We're talking about despite the bias, what do the facts say? That's, that's what we're saying. We're not saying, well, one person is biased towards atheism and one person is biased towards Christianity. They're both biased, therefore they're both as good or as not good. We're saying which one, despite the bias, has provided the evidence. That's, that's what we're saying. So what does this mean to you, the reader? Should you disbelieve what an atheist writes about Christianity just because he's an atheist? Not necessarily, because he could be telling the truth. Should you disbelieve what a Christian writes because, about atheism just because he's a Christian? Again, not necessarily. He too could be telling the truth. Rare. But what about the author's agenda? Does an agenda fatally taint his objectivity? If so, no book is objective, including those by atheists and skeptics. Why? Because all books are written for a reason, all authors have an agenda, and all, or at least most authors, believe what they write. However, that doesn't mean that what they write is false or not objective. While authors are almost never neutral about their topics, personal interest is what drives them, they nevertheless can present their topics objectively. Okay, so... <laughs> 
<laughs> so what's the what is the preface about right how much faith do you need to believe in this book and all we're talking about is everybody's but it's it's like you have to present like why why are they giving this preamble like just answer the question how much faith do you need to believe in this book not well everybody's biased so technically it's biased but it's biased and it's okay because everybody's biased so sometimes the bias is true and sometimes the bias is not true bias 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 and sometimes yes and sometimes no just just answer the damn question <laughs> For example, survivors, survivors of the Holocaust who wrote of their experiences certainly were not neutral bystanders. What? Just answer the question. <laughs> They believed passionately that the Nazis were wrong and they were driven to record their experiences so the world would never forget the Holocaust and hopefully never repeat it. Did their passion or their agenda cause them to bend the facts? Not necessarily. In fact, their passion may have produced the opposite effect. While passion may induce some people to exaggerate, it may drive others to be more meticulous and accurate so not to compromise the credibility of the message they wish to communicate. Okay, so we've, we've established now that some people are biased and sometimes that bias leads people to exaggerate and sometimes it leads people to be sticklers about the facts. So we go back to the question, how much faith do we need to believe this book? Is this a book of facts or is this a book that you need to have faith or at least a certain amount of faith to accept? So we haven't gotten there yet. <sighs> I feel like like I'm judging this based off how well it addresses its own question, you know? <laughs> it's 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 like it's like when the students write something and I, I ask them to write A, B, and C for the topics and they write X, Y, and Z. Yeah, they were correct in what they said about X, Y, and Z, but I asked them for A, B, and C, and therefore I have to mark them down because they didn't address the question and so that's kind of how i'm seeing this we're given a question how much faith do you need to believe in this book i'm an atheist i'm interested in knowing the answer to this and so far we've just established that biases exist and you just have to rely on the facts okay so where are the facts what do we know are facts as you'll see we think the authors of the bible took this meticulous and and accurate road okay i don't care what you think i care what you can show it's also the road we're trying to take in this book. What do you think? What do you show? Come on. And when you're done reading, we hope that you'll let us know if we think we've actually taken that road. Well, so far, <laughs> so far we've meandered, sirs. In the meantime, if you're a skeptic, please keep in mind that you should believe or disbelieve. You, please keep in mind that you should believe or disbelieve what we say because of the evidence we present, not because we have a certain set of religious beliefs. Then just, you just, that, that's it. That it, there it is. <laughs> Why not? Why? Why not just say that? Why are we talking about the Holocaust? What are we doing? We are both Christians, but we were not always Christians. We came to believe through evidence. So the fact that we are Christians is not the issue. Why we are Christians is the important point, And that's the focus of this book. This could have just, this could have been it. That would have been it. You know, I was trying to read The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel, and I gave up. And I, I would only put myself through that suffering to share it with you. Because on my own, this was not entertaining to, to suffer alone. Um, it, it just didn't seem worth it. And the reason that it was suffering is because he wanted to present a quote-unquote case for Christ as someone who claimed to be some kind of former, former detective or police officer or private investigator. I, I don't remember which exactly. And instead we're sitting here talking about, well, the man presented me with a lovely cup of coffee and he set it down at his oak wood table and blah blah blah. This, no, what are we doing? <laughs> You know, it just he, he it was like he was practicing how many adjectives he could use instead of just getting to the meat and potatoes of what this is supposed to be. Acknowledgements. This one we are gonna skip. I don't think that's gonna help us get to, to anywhere else. Introduction. Finding the box top to the puzzle of life. One who claims to be a skeptic of one set of beliefs is actually a true believer in another set of beliefs. Philip E. Johnson. The university religion professor gave his wide-eyed undergraduate class a clear warning the very first day of the semester. Please leave your old religious beliefs at home, he demanded. As we look at the Old Testament, I may make some observations that will run contrary to what you've been taught in Sunday school. 
It's not my purpose to offend anyone, but it is my purpose to be as objective as possible in analyzing the text. Well, that sounded great to me. After all, I, Frank, enrolled in that class because I was in the midst of a spiritual search. I didn't want any religious party line. I just wanted to know if there was a God or not. What better place, I thought, to get some objectivity about God and the Bible than a secular school like the University of Rochester. From the beginning, the professor took a very skeptical view of the Old Testament. He immediately affirmed that the theory that Moses did not write the first five books of the Bible, and that many of the Bible's supposed prophetic passages were written after the fact. He also suggested that the Jews originally believed in many gods, polytheism, but that one god ultimately won the day because the final editors of the Old Testament were, quote, religious fanatic monotheists. Now that's one I haven't heard. Most of the students had no trouble with his analysis, except one young man a couple rows ahead of me. As the semester wore on, the student became visibly more agitated with the professor's skeptical theories. One day, when the professor began to criticize sections of Isaiah, the student could no longer moderate his displeasure. That's not right, he blurted out. This is the word of God. That guy is too religious, I quietly whispered to the person next to me. Look, the professor reminded everyone, I told you, not at, or told you all at the beginning that you must leave your religious beliefs at home. We will not be able to be objective if you can't do that. But you're not being objective, charged the student as he stood up. You're being overly skeptical. Some in the class began to heckle the student. Let the professor teach. Soon. This isn't Sunday school. The professor tried to defuse the situation, but the flustered student stormed out and never returned. Well, I had some sympathy for the student and could see that the professor had his own anti-religious bias, I also wanted to hear more of what he had to say about the Old Testament and particularly about God. When the semester ended, I was somewhat convinced that the professor was right. The Old Testament was not to be taken at face value. However, I still didn't have an answer to my most basic question. Does God exist? I felt completely unfulfilled when the last class ended. I had no closure, no answer. So I approached the professor who was surrounded by students asking final questions. Now I'm gonna say this is way better than everything we've read so far. As, as a book that's supposed to be targeting skeptics, atheists, people on the fence, this is a much better thing they should have started with. They, they should just delete. If, if anybody's hearing this that can edit this book, remove the foreword by David Limbaugh. Remove the, pre the preface, just, just start at the introduction because the rest of it sucks. It sucks unless you already believe this stuff and you're trying to reach people that don't believe this stuff throw it away, just trash, just d delete, 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 okay? Uh, professor, I said, after waiting until just about everyone else had left, thanks for the class. I think I've learned a new perspective, but I still have one huge question. Sure, go ahead, he said. I enrolled in this class to find out if there really is a God or not. Well, is there? Without a moment's hesitation, he snapped. I don't know. You don't know? No, I have no idea. I was stunned. I felt like scolding him by saying, wait a minute, you're teaching me that the Old Testament's false and you don't even know if there's a God or not? The Old Testament could be true if the God actually exists. But since the final grades were not in, I thought better of it. Instead, I simply walked out, frustrated with the entire semester. I could have respected a qualified yes or no with some reasons given, but not I don't know. I could get that from an uninformed man on the street. I expected a lot more from a university religion professor. Whoa, there's the problem right there, right? It is intellectually honest to just say you don't know if you don't know. And it may, it, it should have kind of pointed a younger Frank into understanding even the people that study this professionally don't get any closer to finding a solid answer of yes or no there's so far no real way to determine yes a god or multiple gods exist or no there aren't any instead of saying well that's a lazy answer anybody could have told me that i wish he would have thought well maybe there's a reason that he said i don't know he just got frustrated because he didn't get an answer he, he even says i would have been okay with yes or no with a couple reasons thrown in so he's just mad that somebody wasn't able to definitively answer the question? That's bizarre. I later 
learned that my expectations were too high for the modern university. The term university is actually a composite of words unity and diversity. When one attends a university, I don't think that's, is that the case? Unity and diversity? Let's, let's find out. Yeah, I didn't really think so. So the etymology of the word comes from late Latin universis to universitas, universite to universe or uh, the whole, society, guild, that kind of thing. So it doesn't, it, it means like the whole concept of the, the, the scholarly idea. It doesn't mean, uni where did this come from? See, th when, he, when he says stuff like this, when, when he, I mean any apologeticist, when they say stuff like this, that you can just, like, it just took half a second to Google this, you know? When he says stuff like this, this makes you automatically question the truth of everything in this book. And that's what the preface was about in the last paragraph, basically saying, look, you know, we, we're all... We started as atheists and now we're Christian. Let us show you why through facts. Yes, we're biased, but everybody's biased, but we can show you the facts. And the first fact that he drops on us is not true. This is not a good start. You know what I mean? When one attends a university, he is supposed to be guided in the quest of finding unity in diversity. That, yeah, it's not what he means. Namely, how all the diverse fields of knowledge, the arts, philosophy, physical science, mathematics, fit together to provide a unified picture of life. Now that, yeah, that might be a, a better idea, but I don't think unity in diversity makes sense. I mean, the word doesn't even, I mean, the reason I looked it up is because I know the word doesn't come from English. I just didn't know where it came from. So anyway, a tall task indeed, but one that the modern university is not only abandoned, but reversed. Instead of universities, we now have pluriversities, institutions that deem every viewpoint, no matter how ridiculous, just as valid as any other. That is, except the viewpoint that just one religion or worldview could be true. That's one viewpoint considered intolerant and bigoted on most college campuses. Now, I, I don't know where he went to school, but I know that there were wrong answers, <laughs> you know? There's a wrong way to write in APA format or MLA format that it's not everybody's opinions okay. If you can't support your opinion with facts, it is not acceptable to submit it into a class for like a science course, for example. If you're being asked to create a creative writing story and instead you turn in a biography about uh, a person that actually existed and it's just a hard, factual, dry thing. That is the wrong way to turn in your submission that is not correct in how you interpreted the creative writing assignment. So I, I don't understand this. I've never experienced this idea that every viewpoint, no matter how ridiculous, is just as valid as any other. And I, I, I mean, obviously, Frank and I went to, to college or university at, at different time periods, but I can't imagine that this was ever true on a college campus, that everything was okay. Oh, except for Christianity, but everything is okay. I mean, we had Christians on campus. I was a Christian on campus, you know? Despite the denials streaming from our universities, we believe that there is a way to discover unity in diversity. And if we were to discover such unity, it would be like seeing the box top of a jigsaw puzzle just as the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle are difficult to put together without the picture on, t on the box top, many, the many diverse pieces of life make no sense without some kind of unifying big picture. The question is, does anyone have the box top to this puzzle we call life? Many world religions claim that they do. Are any of them correct? Okay, great. And it says figure I.1, and it's a jigsaw puzzle box that looks bust- no. I was gonna say it looks busted. I think it's because it's it's not straight. I don't know why it's not straight. There's like a, a bumped piece, so it looks like a busted box. Um, but it's got the, the two fingers touching, what is it called? The birth of Adam, something like that. But the, you know, where God is touching Adam's finger. Religion and the box top. World religions are often attempts to provide a box top that allows you to see how many pieces of life's puzzle make a complete cohesive picture. 
this picture usually and for good reason begins with some claim about God. What someone believes about God affects everything else that he or she believes. When Mortimer Adler was asked why God's section was the largest in the Great Books of the Western World series, which he edited, he insightfully observed that it's because there are more implications flow from the subject of God than any other subject. Indeed, the five most consequential in life, consequential questions in life are these. Number one, origin, where do we come from? Number two, identity, who are we? Number three, meaning, why are we here? Number four, morality, how should we live? Number five, destiny, where, sh where are we going? Now, I, I'm kind of, you know, I'm on, like, I like his, his analogy here about the box top and the puzzle of life and how a lot of religions claim to be that, that image to fit those pieces. But I'm just curious, would you guys describe morality as how should we live? I feel like it's how, morality, how should we treat others, maybe? Meaning is how should we live? The answers to each of these questions depend on the existence of God. If God exists, then there's ultimate meaning and purpose to your life. If there's a real purpose to your life, then there's a real right and a real wrong way to live it. Choices you make now not only affect you here, but will affect you in eternity. On the other hand, if there is no God, then your life ultimately means nothing. Since there is no enduring purpose to life, there's no right or wrong way to live it. And it doesn't matter how you live or what you believe, your destiny is dust. Now, I really have a problem with this because when I was Christian, I felt like life was meaningless. Why do we live? We're told that our lifespan is so short compared to forever. So I, I just always thought, why does God want us to suffer through a physical life? If he knows which choices we're going to make, he knows whether we're going to heaven or hell. Why do we even have this? Why not just create souls in heaven or create souls in hell? And then I guess for that matter, why even create a hell? Why not just create souls in heaven? And I, I really just didn't understand that. I thought, what's the purpose of my life? I've already found God. I, I could die and that would be awesome because this life sucks. We're told that this life is nothing, that this life is terrible, that we should hate the world, but um, not be of the world, just live in the world. And we should reject the world, reject and hate and everything's crap and only God is true and only godliness is the best and etc. etc. So I was hoping I would die constantly, just hoping I would go to bed and not wake up because there's no point. I've already found the meaning of life and I couldn't kill myself because then I would go to hell. How could I die? and not have it be considered killing myself, I could go into missionary work and get hopefully martyred, or I can go into the military and try to reach people for God, but also hopefully get killed. It is one of the reasons I went to the military. I just wanted to die. There's a reason I went in as a combat engineer to work with mines and stuff. I was hoping to die in a way that didn't count as suicide because I, I just wanted to be with God, you know? I found no purpose or meaning to my life. I found that life was just a waste. And why am I here? I just want to be with God. Why do I got to deal with people and whatever this trash that life has to offer? I don't want it. I just want God. I just want to be dead. So I, I really hate this idea that with God, there is a purpose. There is no purpose according to the Christian belief system. There is no purpose to life. And there's no fun or anything in death either. We're just in heaven constantly praising Yahweh. That's it. That's the account of heaven. It's not like we're running around and having a good time. It's that we hang out with God and we just tell him how great he is. So which world religion, if any, answers the God question correctly? Does any religion provide the true box top for life? The common wisdom says no for a number of reasons. First, many say it's unreasonable to believe that one religion could be exclusively true. If one religion were really true, it would mean that billions of religious people from every other faith are wrong, and they have been wrong through the centuries. And that's a big problem if Christianity is true, because Christianity seems to teach that non-Christians are going to hell. There's also the not unfounded fear that those who think that they have the truth will be intolerant of those who won't accept it. Easygoing Americans are more apt to believe that no religion is the truth. This sentiment, well, what do you mean easygoing Americans? Like the majority of Americans are Christian. <laughs> what do you mean that they're more apt to believe that no religion is correct? But this is something evangelicals believe that they're the only real Christians and they're a minority in the US. Therefore, everybody else uh, just accepts 
either everything's okay, but technically they still believe in God, or they're all just atheists. This sentiment is often illustrated by the favorite parable of many university professors, the parable of the six blind men and the elephant. This is where each blind man feels a different part of the elephant and therefore reaches a different conclusion about the object in front of him. One grabs the tusk and says, this is a spear. Another feels the trunk and says, this is a snake. The one hugging the leg claims, this is a tree. The blind man holding the tail thinks, I have a rope. The one feeling the ear believes this is a fan, and the one leaning on the elephant's side is certain that this is a wall. These blind men are said to represent world religions because they can each come to a different conclusion about what they are sensing. Like each blind man, we are told no one religion has the truth, no one religion has the complete box top. Religions are simply different paths up the same mountain. This, of course, greatly appeals to the broadly tolerant American mind. In America, truth in religion is considered an oxymoron. There is no truth in religion, we are told. It's all a matter of taste or opinion. You like chocolate? I like vanilla. You like Christianity? I like Islam. If Buddhism works for you, then it's true for you. Besides, you ought not judge me for my beliefs. Is anybody watching this a person who was raised this way in a religion? I was raised in this type of like evangelical Christianity, Pentecostal Christianity specifically. And I was never taught that religion or no religion was equally uh, okay. That it's all just somebody's opinion. I was taught that this is wrong and that there's only one correct religion and everything else is a corruption because of Satan. I I've, don't know if I've really met people who are taught this in their religious circles. They may come to that feeling, belief by themselves, but I've never seen anyone taught that. The second major problem with truth in religion is that some pieces of life seem to defy explanation. They don't appear to fit any religious box top. These include the existence of evil and the silence of God in the face of that evil. These are especially powerful objections to anyone claiming that an all-powerful theistic God exists. Many skeptics and atheists argue that if one true powerful God actually exists, then he would intervene to clear up all the confusion. After all, if God is really out there, why does he seem to hide himself? Why doesn't he just show up and debunk the false religions and end all the controversy? Why doesn't he intervene to stop all the evil in the world, including all the religious wars that are such a black mark on his name? And why does he allow bad things to happen to good people? These are difficult questions for anyone claiming their theistic religion is true. I like this. This seems to be addressing actual things that atheists actually say. What, what was, like, the beginning of this book, if I was just stopping there, like, just reading it to get a taste for the book, I, I would have put the book back. Like, I, we're, we're reading this because it's a really well-known book. I wanted to get into it. I wanted to share it with you guys and hear what you guys think about it. it just reading the, the foreword and the preface, if that was how I had to judge the book, I, I would not have have gotten it because it just doesn't seem to be addressing what I wanted it to address. So I, yeah, uh, Frank, please. <laughs> Finally, many modern intellectuals imply that any box top based on religion wouldn't be legitimate anyway. Why? Because they say only science yields truth. Not only has evolution removed the need for God, they say, nobody says this, but only what is testable in a laboratory can be considered true. Nobody says this. That is, only science deals in matters of fact, while religion stays in the realm of faith. That is a different statement. So there's no sense in trying to muster evidence or facts to support religion, because that'd be like mustering facts to prove you like chocolate ice cream tastes better than vanilla ice cream. No. It's that... So for anyone who is religious watching this, just to see what an atheist thinks of this book, it's not that one is better than the other, like a, a preference thing. It's that when you have a God like the Christian God, where he's inherently untestable, then you cannot use something that is a tool to test. That's why. How do you test God to gather data and arrive at a conclusion if you say that your God is inherently untestable, how do you do that? This, this is the reason they say there's no reason or that they're, they're different or that you cannot use science to prove God because the God of the Bible is a God that doesn't allow himself to be tested and science tests things to get answers. This is the reason. It has nothing to do with, oh, religion's just an opinion. It's that it's a claim 
that doesn't have a falsifiable hypothesis. That's the reason. You can't prove preferences, therefore they insist that religion is never a matter of, object of objective fact, but merely subjective taste. Any box top derived from religion couldn't provide the objective picture of life we're looking for. So where does this all leave us? Is the search for God and for life's box top hopeless? <laughs> Should we assume that there's no objective meaning to life and each invent our own subjective box top? Should we be content with the professor's I don't know answer? We don't think so. We believe there is a real answer, and despite these powerful objections we have identified, which we will address in the later chapters, we believe that the answer is very reasonable. In fact, we believe the answer is more reasonable and requires less faith than any other possible answer, including that of an atheist. Let's begin to show you what we mean. This is quite a long introduction, and we are already past an hour, so I'm going to go ahead and stop here. I did not expect the uh, beginning of the book to be this long. I didn't preview this book, so I, I did think we were just going to jump into it. So we've gotten through the forward, the reviews, the preface, and the first part of the introduction. I will say, again, the introduction does seem to be a bit more promising for addressing things that atheists actually believe or think or have objections to. So, yeah, I wish we would have just started here. <laughs> With that being said, I hope this was interesting for you, especially if you're a religious person who doesn't know how to speak to atheists. Don't, don't do what David did. Okay. <laughs> With that being said, please feel free to leave your thoughts and comments in the comment section below. And there is a pinned comment there that has other ways to contact me, such as on Instagram, Twitter, or Discord. And you can also join our Patreon, which gives you previews to all of these videos, as well as an exclusive live stream uh, once a month, and just any other things that I want to post there that are just for you guys. So feel free to join us for as little as a dollar a month. It helps out because a lot of these videos can't be monetized or they're not well monetized because of their religious nature. <laughs> as always, thanks for listening.